Well, the Lord has given us a full house this morning. Amen, church? Amen. And I think today's lesson is going to be one that is going to encourage and yet challenge us all. Amen. We've been studying the book of Luke, and today we're going to be doing Luke chapter 22. Now, we've got a lot of work to do today because there are 71 verses in this chapter. So I need you to follow along right here and make sure that we can get as much meat out as possible. The title for today's lesson comes from Jesus' words to the Jewish leadership that came to arrest him in the garden. Jesus said to them, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. The title of our lesson is The Hour of Darkness. There are four points. Covering verses 1 through 6, Satan in the temple. Verses 7 through 38, Satan in the upper room. Verses 39 through 53, Satan in the garden. And verse 54 through 71, Satan in the courts. Truly, darkness reigns. Let's get into the text. I'm sure that most of us remember our study early on in the book of Luke, where after Jesus was baptized, in chapter 4, he endures the three great temptations in the great confrontation with Satan. And how, like many of us as baby Christians, as we come out of the waters of baptism, Satan is waiting right there to take us out. Jesus had this cosmic confrontation with Satan. And the Bible simply notes... Luke in particular, in chapter 4, verse 13. After these temptations, the devil left him till a more opportune time. Chapter 22 is that opportune time. Let's get into the reading. Now the feast of the unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus. For they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Right here, we see the cosmic battle between Satan and God. As a matter of fact, what we're going to find out in the concluding three chapters in the book of Luke is that exactly the same battle is where Satan is working his plan for destruction and God is working his plan for salvation. When we're going through our tough times, be assured of this. Very often we sense the darkness of Satan but understand this, in the very same moment, there is the presence of God trying to bring salvation out of the darkness. Are you with me there? Because rest assured, where it's darkest, the light shines brightest. Right here, in almost a chilling note, it says that the Passover was approaching. This, of course, is not by chance, but by God. The Passover happened in the book of Exodus. After the ten plagues, God told Moses, I am going to send a death angel to pass over Egypt. But amongst my people, I want you to shed the blood of a lamb. Smear that over the doorpost so that when my death angel comes above Egypt, he will pass over my people and they will be saved. Well, this Passover of the Old Testament foreshadows the Passover of the New Testament. Once more, it is for the salvation of God's people, except this is for eternal salvation. And the blood is the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. We find in verse 3, the notation that Satan entered Judas called Iscariot. Now, there's some debate. Some people simply say that Iscariot notes that he was from a certain town in Judea. As a matter of fact, that would make him the only non-Galilean apostle. 
But others believe that in Aramaic, Iscariot means the false one. And so I think that's why Luke notes it so up front right here. Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. One of the ones in the inner circle that had walked and been with Jesus for three years. We find now that Satan has entered into a disciple who now is going to the Jewish leadership, composed of the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard. And they discuss how to portray Jesus. Luke is showing that now the Jewish leadership has entered into a pact with Satan. As a matter of fact, when Judas initiates going to them, they were feeling trapped. As a matter of fact, in some of the texts, in the synoptics, it says that they weren't going to go after him during the Passover because just too many people were around Jesus. But now that an insider would give away the secret places that Jesus dwelt, the Bible simply says right here, they were delighted. They were filled with an unholy glee that now they could get to Jesus. And they agreed to give him money. You know, the question comes, why? Did Judas betray Jesus? I think the synoptics give us clear indication. Turn to John 12. Verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. That the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objective. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a day's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Wow. And the other disciples knew nothing about it. You see, you allow Satan to come into your life when your life has secret compartments. In Matthew chapter 26, we, I think, get the final issue of why he betrays Jesus. Again, picking up the same parallel text in verse 6, chapter 26. While Jesus was in Bethany at the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, which he poured on his head, and he's reclined at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, she said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you'll always have with you, but you'll not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth. Wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then... One of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? But once more, the money theme comes in strong. But I think the word then gives it away. Right here, we come to see that Judas came to understand in a very disappointing way that Jesus was going to die. Judas, like many of the Jews of his day, was expecting Jesus to be Messiah parallel to David. David overthrew the Philistines and freed the Israelites. He was expecting Jesus to overthrow the Romans and free the Israelites. And now it was clear, even in Jesus' mind, he was going to die. He was disappointed. And disappointment leads to bitterness. This bitterness was so sharp that he gave way to his sinful flesh and the craving for money and betrayed the Son of God. In Hebrews chapter 12, the sin of bitterness is laid out in verse 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. The longer you're a disciple, the greater the chance for bitterness. 
Bitterness is an insidious sin. It was so powerful that it caused Judas to miss the grace of God. And it caused trouble and defile thousands. Bitterness caused Judas to quit being a disciple. See, whenever we have disappointment as a disciple, the temptation for bitterness will come on you as Satan came on Judas. When you become bitter, you may even decide to quit relationships in the body of Christ because of disappointment. When you become bitter, you may be tempted to quit even your marriage. Now, it may begin to foster itself early on as lust or grumbling or criticalness. But bottom line, this can lead to adultery and thus sever the spiritual marriage bond made in heaven between God and a woman. Bitterness can come into your life with disappointment and you can quit being in leadership because of your disappointment. And ultimately, bitterness can come into your life when you sense an overwhelming disappointment of where your life is at. And you even struggle with the thought of suicide. Indeed, that's exactly what happened to Judas. He commits suicide. Seeing the emptiness of the money that was given to him, he even tries to give it back. And yet at the end, his life, so disappointing to himself, ends in suicide. You know, I think as disciples, we minimize bitterness and greed. And yet, some of the manifestations that I think that happen in men and women are a little bit different. Bitterness in men often evidences itself with withdrawing, or as some books say, to withdraw into the cave, to disassociate. Other men, it causes them to be angry. For women, there's a tendency to be critical and to grumble. And these are the signs that you can be taken out of the kingdom. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that God struck dead the Israelites that committed adultery and immorality. And God struck dead the Israelites that grumbled. We so minimize these sins. You know, I remember early on when Elaine and I had moved here to Los Angeles in 1990. Our lives were in turmoil. There were a lot of challenges that were going on. And sometimes we have a tendency to get disappointed in our mate that they didn't somehow meet our need or somehow didn't do this. And, and you know, if you don't really have people in your life, and that's the value of discipling, amen, guys? You know, things can start to mount up. And, and frankly, things have begun to mount up in our marriage. It's sad to say, I can't even remember what was the cause of one of our worst fights because the real issue was just bitterness in my heart and bitterness in Elena's heart. I was so angry. She was so critical and grumbling. I still remember the scene. I was in the bedroom. I'm just saying, Elena, do this and do it. She goes, you are demon possessed. I go, no. <laughs> wow. Have you ever felt that hardness of heart? See, that's, that's Satan coming on you. Let me tell you something. You can feel your heart get hard. That's bitterness. You've got to repent or you can end up just like Judas. You see, it's clear right here. Satan was in the temple. In the heart of the Jewish leadership. Judas had made a pact with Satan. The Jewish leadership had made a pact with Satan. And their end was death. Point two. Let's get back. Okay. 
Verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to pray for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. And say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where's the guest room where I may prepare the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room all furnished. Make preparations there. Then they left and found things just as Jesus told them. So they prepared the Passover. Our second point, Satan in the upper room. Right here, these, these six verses right here, the way that Luke conveys them to us absolutely shows Jesus being in control and the divine design of the moment. Remember, Satan's working his scheme at one point. Jesus, through God, is working the scheme of salvation. And so he says, hey, we've got to prepare the Passover meal. So he talks to Peter and John, and he says, you guys have got to make the preparations. He says, well, where do you want to prepare for? He says, well, you're going to meet a man carrying a jar of water that will meet you at the city gate. Now, some people think that this is supernatural, and it may well be. I happen to think it, it may not be, because he says, now, when you meet this man... You take him and follow him till you come to his master. And then say the teacher wants to have a room to celebrate the Passover. Now, of course, rooms during the Passover time were rare. But most likely, the very fact that Jesus says the teacher wants it means that the owner of the house was a disciple of Jesus. Jesus knew him. But it still conveys the same point. Jesus is in control. There's divine design. Well, now, what needed to be done for the preparations? Well, of course, first of all, secure the room. Secondly, get the lamb slain at the temple. Thirdly, buy bitter herbs and bread and wine for the Passover feast. Amen? Well, let's see what happens. Verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and the apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Well, I mean, do you, do you sense that energy inside of Jesus right here? So I've, I've, I've just really been looking forward to celebrating this Passover. But why? Well, this is, this is why he was born. He was the Passover lamb. And this was the time, the last time, of the last night he would live in his earthly ministry, he wanted to share this really, really special moment with all the guys that were closest to him. And then he vows a vow of abstinence. He says, I'm not going to eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Well, read on. It's a little bit of a perplexing text that comes. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes once more, the vow of abstinence. Then he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, this confuses some people, because they say, well, I thought we we're supposed to have the bread first at communion, and then we head into the fruit of the vine. Amen. A little background right here. The Passover at this time, so to speak, had three, and some say four cups. The first cup was given, which Jesus does right here. And to show the oneness, he takes the big cup that he has... And he divides it with all the guys. This was called the cup of thanksgiving. And of course, we know that the Greek word eucharistio means to give thanks. And so that's where the expression comes for communion to be the, the Eucharist. It's the time of giving thanks. But that is the first cup. That's the first cup. The second cup was then to be given as an explanation of the exodus itself after a song was sung. 
The third cup was to be passed around after the partaking of the lamb and the bread. And then if there's a fourth cup, it celebrated the final song of the time itself. Now, I find it interesting right here. In verse 14, it says, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. If you look at the book of Exodus, you'll find that actually they were supposed to partake of the Passover with their sandals on, staff in hand, all the stuff tucked into their belt and everything like that. They were supposed to be ready to go. Well, by this time, in the Jewish custom, it had become that this meal in particular was to be a meal that showed that the Jews were at peace with God and peace with each other. And so Jesus likewise partakes in this custom, showing this sense of peace. And yet you've got to admit, in the midst of what's hanging over his head, that's incredible. That's incredible. And so we see right here that, in fact, the bread is broken. We know from John chapter 13, verse 27, after the bread is broken, that's when Judas leaves. Judas does not partake in the last cup of which the covenant in his blood or in his death is made. And, of course, we have that for communion. Let's see how important communion is supposed to be, guys. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11. You know, we use this passage a lot, but I'm, I'm not sure that we really get the full understanding of what communion is supposed to be. <clears throat> Paul gets this by revelation in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, the Passover lamb. Amen, guys? Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord, an unworthy man will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks of the cup. For if anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. These are the challenges of our spiritual conditions before the Lord. He says, there is one basic reason why you're a weak Christian, why you're a sick Christian. What's that mean? Well, the things that you were healed of, now you're still festering those wounds after you've become a disciple. Or you're an asleep Christian. In other words, you're dead, but you're still coming to church. He says, well, why... Our disciples, weak, sick, and falling asleep. It's because they are not focused in on the body and the blood of Jesus and what he's done for them. When you really focus and when you understand that the body and the blood of Jesus is everything, there is no issue in your life that should make you weak, sick, or fall asleep. You know, I, I've, I've got to really lift up a, a brother. That uh, I really love a lot. He's, he's in King's Kingdom right now, and that's uh, Gino Ezra Mendes. Yeah. And Gino, bless his heart, had been struggling for several months in a way, and, and yet he really wanted to get it going. And so he rededicated himself to the Lord, and his first challenge came is that he got offered this incredible job to work uh, for a minor league baseball club. And, uh, you know, if you're a guy and you love sports, oh, baby, that's a cranking job. Well, he called me on up and called a couple other brothers on up. The problem is he'd have to miss half of Sundays to come. And I said, brother, that's not really seeking the Lord. And, you know, you got to admit, guys, why did Jesus, uh, Judas continue to sink into the darkness? He missed communion. He missed being there with the brother. He purposefully left. And, you know, let's face it. There are some of us that are weak and sick and falling asleep. And how do we know? You're missing Bible talk. You're missing devotional. You even missing the beast party. And what happens is, you see, 
We, we kind of say, well, a beach party, a Bible talk, it's not important. It's a you have totally missed what God's church is all about. God's church is supposed to be your, physic, your spiritual family, even above your physical family. And if you get that all whacked on out, then bottom line, you're going to start to get weak. You're going to start to get sick. And you eventually fall asleep. I really appreciate it. Michael Purdy. Last week, came on up here, and uh, he'd been a member of another fellowship for years. He comes on up, and he says, you know something, guys? I, I just really want to get open and get real with you guys. I'm fired up to place membership today, but really, it's, it's more of a restoration. He says, because, see, for the last several years, I've fallen asleep spiritually. And he talked about sleep. He says, you know, when you sleep, you kind of shut your eyes, and then you wake up. And you just don't know how long you've been asleep. He says, I don't know how long I've been asleep. But you know something? It's awesome to see Michael Purdy awake now today. Amen, guys? You see, today, we have weak and sick and fallen asleep disciples amongst us. And as disciples of Christ, we've got to talk to them. And we have got to bring before them Jesus remembering his body and blood and the sacrifice that he made for us. Are you with me right here? Let's get back to our text. We're still in the upper room. We find here that Jesus then lays out that indeed one of them is going to betray him. They question each other. Well, who is it going to be? Who is it going to be? And probably out of this comes the discussion, well, it's not going to be, I'm never going to betray the Lord. I mean, after all, I'm the one that's going to take the strongest stand. And that then enters the discussion about who's going to be the greatest. Well, then Jesus says in verse 28, he says, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. Remember, Judas is gone. And I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So he says, yes, indeed, because you stood by me, you are going to be in leadership in God's new kingdom. Amen? Amen. Now watch this, verse 31. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I pray for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to, to prison and to death. Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times, that you even know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did, did you lack anything? No, well, nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It's written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you, this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples say, well, see, Lord, here, here are two swords. That, that's enough, Jesus replied. The guy still didn't get it. Right here, we find in the upper room, Jesus says, listen, guys, I am going to confer on you a kingdom. The actual Greek word right here could be translated covenant. I am going to covet you into a kingdom. He says, but here's what's going to happen. Simon, Simon. Remember Martha, Martha? It's not good when Jesus repeats your name twice. You don't want to hear. You just want to hear your name one time when you get on up there. You don't want to go, Tracy, Tracy. Tracy! You just don't want to hear it two times. One time, Lord, just one time. (laughs) Notice right here, he doesn't call Peter, Peter, but he calls him Simon, his pre-disciple name. And he goes, Simon, Simon. Satan's asked to sift you as sweet. Now, that's very interesting. Our minds immediately float back to the book of Job. Where the name of Job is brought to God by Satan himself. He says, well, this guy, deny you if I strike him. You bless him too much, God. He says, do anything you want to him, just don't take his life. See, God limits what Satan can do to us. That's why the scriptures teach very accurately in 1 Corinthians Chapter 10, it says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. 
And God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up underneath it. In other words, no excuse for falling away. No excuse. Well, what leads to it? Well, verse 12 says, so you think you're standing firm? Be careful that you don't fall. It's pride. You're depending on yourself. But we now understand that God limits the amount of temptation to the degree that we can stand up under it. Is that encouraging or not? He says, but even though that's going to happen, Simon, Simon, Satan is going to sift you as wheat. Now, you understand the idea of sifting, right? Like one of those sieves, you know, and you got the, the wheat in there. And the whole idea is it's trying to separate the, the, the wheat kernel from the chaff, the, the wasted part. And so the term sift like wheat would be our term to pick someone to pieces or to take someone apart. Simon, Simon, Satan is going to take you apart. But I pray for you. Man, thank you, Jesus. That your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, implication, you're going to tank. <laughs> and when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brothers. You know, bottom line, we need to get a conviction that Satan is after us. To tear us apart like a lion. He wants to destroy us. When does he tear us apart? When we no longer have the heart and the mindset of a disciple. And we live in the fleshly ways before we became a disciple. That is when Satan tears us apart. And you see, you got baptized. And you got the Holy Spirit. And the old self died. But you know something? You're still stuck with your flesh. And the flesh you had before baptism still exists after baptism. And for some of us, we got a little bit more of it even after baptism. Know what I'm talking about right here? But that flesh still goes in that direction. Whatever your flesh was before you were baptized, Simon, Simon, is going to be where Satan will attack and tear you apart. Because his goal is to destroy you. That is his goal. But God's hand will hold back even Satan from something you cannot stand by faith. And that's why he says in verse 34, I tell you, Peter, yeah, you say you're going to be willing to go with me to prison and death, but I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you'll deny, deny, deny me three times. And then he goes into a dissertation. He says, you know, remember that time? Of course, we know it is Luke 9, somewhat Luke 10, where Jesus sends off the apostles and later the 72 without a purse, without a knapsack, uh, totally without anything, without a sword. And he says, hey, when you went out with nothing, did you lack anything? They said, No. He says, well, now, guys, things are going to change. I'm not going to be here anymore. So now you need a purse, <laughs> you need a knapsack, and you need a sword. But not really. Because God will take care of every need. And so the guys are getting kind of fired up because they like you saying, oh, man, here it comes. We're going for swords. I've been waiting for the sword thing. We're, we're going after the road. Oh, amen. He said, sell a cloak, get a sword. I'm ready. Lord, we got two of them already. She says, okay, guys, that's, that's enough. That's enough. How about it? Has Satan been sifting you this week? This month? Have you thought about quitting? Have you thought about giving up? Are you resolved? Are you resolved to keep your faith? 
no matter what. Amen. You know, it's really been amazing. I shared this with the Orange County ministry. You know, in some ways, we have just a baby church right here. Church was just planted about 16 months ago. Lord has blessed us with about 140, 150 baptisms in that time. We start off with 40 disciples. But, but perhaps as exciting as, as the baptisms are, we've had about 80 people restored to the Lord. Is that awesome? And I really hope and pray that, that, that we will pray for those that have turned back, that have become Simon instead of Peter, that in fact we can get in there and really help them return to their first love. Amen, guys? But it's very clear. Satan was in the upper room. Let's move on. Satan in the garden. This is, this is exciting right here. This is, this is good stuff. Verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. You know, the Mount of Olives, just below it, is the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not a very big place. Been there a few times. But, but it's, it's a cool spot because it overlooks the city of Jerusalem. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, and we know it is the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to them, Pray that you'll not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but your will be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he went back to the disciples. He found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you'll not fall into temptation. So much right here. I sense this, 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 this emotion inside of Jesus. When Luke writes, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond him. Stone's throw is a pretty good distance. He's going to be so far beyond him, he's not going to be able to hear their prayers. For two reasons. One, he's a long ways away, and two, they fell asleep. <laughs> but the withdrawal from somebody, it kind of denotes a sense of being torn away. I mean, it becomes clear to Jesus he's in this thing all alone now. He kneels down. He prays. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. What is the cup? It's the cup of wrath. It's the cup of judgment. He says, if you're willing to take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will, Father. And then, after he prayed this prayer, the Bible says that an angel from heaven comes on down and encourages him. That would fire me on up. I don't know about you guys. But he says it was such an anguishing moment that he was actually sweating drops of blood. You know, some people, they kind of blow that off as just an assembly right there. It's, it's not. It really happens. You can look at the medical textbooks. When someone gets to such a stress point, their capillaries are constricted, they actually rupture, and your blood becomes ripped, uh, mixed with sweat. That's how much stress Jesus is under. Very interesting, and we know after about three hours of prayer, he goes back to the disciples, he finds them asleep, and they're exhausted. Why are they exhausted? They're exhausted with sorrow. They're so disappointed. They're so down. Have you ever been there? You've gotten plenty of sleep from the number of hours that you've been in bed, but you are exhausted because of disappointment and sorrow and bitterness that have stolen your strength. It's why you're sleeping. Get up and pray so that you'll not fall into temptation. It's so clear right here what Jesus is saying to us. He's saying if you're going to stay faithful, it's all about your personal relationship with God. 
the reason people fall away is their personal relationship with God drifts away or is cut off. That's the only reason people fall away. Oh, yeah, there are circumstances. Yeah, there are issues. But we now understand that there's no temptation that's going to come our way that we don't have the power to overcome. And secondly, we now understand that prayer sustained in Jesus, even in the midst of the stress of taking on the cup of wrath, God sends an angel to him. And let me tell you something. If he's going to send an angel to Jesus, he'll send an angel to the rest of us too. Amen, guys. And Jesus stays strong. But his disciples are weakened by sorrow, disappointment, and bitterness. Let's keep going. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve. Whoa! Does that hit you right there? This crowd comes on up in the darkness of the night. Just gives that eeriness there, that sinister sense. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? The sign of friendship became the sign of betrayal. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. We know from another one of the Gospels, it was Peter. <laughs> yeah, you guessed it. It was Peter. <laughs> but Jesus says, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. Then Jesus said, the chief priest, officers, temple guard, and the elders would come with him. Am I leading rebellion that you come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you didn't lay a hand on me. But this is your hour. When darkness reigns. What was happening here? Well, number one, we find that Jesus, after praying, is willing to take on the cup. See, what will sustain us is submitting to the sovereignty of God. So often we don't like the way that God is leading us. And then we get bitter. Sometimes the people around us blaming them. But in fact, it's, it's the Lord that's got us. And yes, Satan's trying to work the same thing. In the very same action is Satan and God warring over your very soul. How will you make it? It's trusting in the sovereignty of God. And saying, not my will, but your will be done. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, that's what I'm going to do. So what happens here? Jesus told totally at peace. He rebukes the disciples. For the swords and cutting off the guy's ear. And rebukes the Jewish leadership. The only guy that's cool, calm, and collected is Jesus right here. He's in control. Well, let's look at the Jewish leadership. That's chief priests. They represent the religious leadership of the Jews. You have the temple officers. That represents the military leadership of the Jews. And you have the elders that represent the civil leadership of the Jews. I mean, the leadership of the Jews is clearly in league with Judas, who is in league with Satan. That's what Luke is saying to us right here. But there's something more that Luke the doctor notes. Yes, he's the only one that noted the drops of sweat mixed with blood. For a doctor, that's very interesting. But he'll notice another thing. He says, you know, when the battle first came on, Peter draws the sword, slices off the servant's ear. What's Jesus do? These are the enemies that are going to arrest him and kill him. What's he do? Finds the ear. (laughs) Guys, can you hold a second? (laughs) Dude, come here. There you go. Whoa. This was his enemy. Now, why the little story right here? By Luke, it's pretty obvious. Without an ear, you cannot hear. And if you strike your enemy, they will not listen to you. But if you love your enemy, they can hear the saving message, which is the healing message of Jesus Christ. Remember the word sozo? It means heal and save. One in the same words. And so he hears, very interesting, 
to me. In John 18, verse 10, the servant's name is given to us. His name is Malchus. Now, why would a servant's name be listed? I mean, there really aren't that many names in the Bible, are there not? Why would the servant's name be listed? It's because he became a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus gave him ears to hear, and he responded to the saving and healing message of Jesus Christ. Does that fire you on up? You know, this week, we have, in my opinion, one of the more extraordinary articles in our bulletin. If you look at your bulletin, please. It's the Anakea family on the front right there. And let me tell you something. Rob gets very real about where sin took him. Rob drifted away from the Lord, and what happens when he drifted away from the Lord? He got into pornography and lust and masturbation, and that eventually took him out to adultery. That's why when, when you're not focused in on the Lord, when you don't have discipling in your life, Satan's going to get you. And let me tell you something, Rob lays it out here. And there's a lot of people that have problems with pornography and the garbage that's on the internet. It's a very dark world. It was, it's interesting. You know, in the olden days when I lived in L.A., I used to go to, like, movies a lot. And I, I don't go very often right now. We go, golly, maybe once every two months, once every three months. And a lady was going, oh, I want to go see Mamma Mia. <laughs> okay, we got to go see The Dark Knight. Amen. I guess that's a fair trade-off. Dark Knight, Mamma Mia. Amen. And, and for those that haven't seen Mamma Mia, it, it, it's, it's basically the soundtrack of all the ABBA songs of all time. And yet, in it, it's had, you know, the ABBA songs have a tendency to be kind of really upbeat, you know. And the whole movie glorifies immorality, glorifies adultery, and glorifies homosexuality. And yet, you have the happy songs of the ABBAs. <laughs> I'm coming out of that thing. I go, Elena. She goes, I know, I know. I know, I know. I know. I mean, that's how dark this world is. They put happy music to all the sins that'll take you on out. You know, I appreciate Rob Birdie. They heard about the church here from some friends in Hawaii. They came and visited. They go, oh, man. There's still hope. There's still hope. After a couple weeks of studying, about a year and a half ago, Rob got restored. The same day, Burgundy got restored. And two weeks later, Darian was so taken aback, he gets baptized. Now, that's a happy ending worthy of some applause. Amen, guys? But you know something? When you become a Christian, that doesn't always happen. When you get restored, that doesn't always happen. What if Rob got restored and Burgundy goes, listen, I'm so bitter towards your sin, I'm not coming back to church. Darian goes, Dad, you're an idiot. And they turn their back. Does that make the decision any less valid? You see, we want all these happy stories in our own time about our wife, mom, cousin, daughter, granddaughter coming to the Lord within two weeks after we make our decision, and then we'll be happy. No, no, that's really not what it's all about. Let me tell you something. Let me be clear. The only hope you have for your family is for you to be faithful to God to the end. Sadly, I think that we bought into a lot of Pollyanna-type thinking that all of our physical family is going to become Christians. And yet Jesus over and over goes saying, hey, your father's going to try to kill you. Your son's going to try to kill you. Everybody, your own family members will betray you. We need to get our Bibles out instead of our Pollyanna storybooks. And we need to understand that, yeah, they may not come around in two weeks. They may not come around in two years or 20 years, but at the end of the day, 
Their only hope lies in you being faithful to the end. In you not giving in to weakness and sickness and falling asleep because they're going to be watching you. And to me, that's what Rob Anakea needs to be commended for. Amen? You see, as Jesus said, this is your hour when darkness reigned. Let's finish up. In verse 54, we now find Satan in the courts. Now, we expect the courts to be full of truth, right? Amen? Verse 54. Then seizing Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Now, let's stop here a second. For those that have been with us in the Luke series, we understand from Luke chapter 3 that this was a rather unique time period in the uh, Jewish high priesthood. As a matter of fact, Luke 3 says the high priesthood, singular, of Annas and Caiaphas. Fairly easy to explain. Annas reigned officially as the high priest from 6 AD to 15 AD. A few years later, his son-in-law Caiaphas took over, but Annas was still living, and Caiaphas was the official high priest till about 36 AD during the time of Jesus. Amen, guys? So, we see right here that Jesus is taken to the high priest's house. Most likely, Annas lives in one side of the house and Caiaphas in another. So it's the high priest's house. Amen, guys? Then it's simply noted, Peter followed at a distance. Now, that's not a good thing to follow at a distance. But the point is, he's still hanging in there. It's actually semi-encouraging. Verse 55. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. So we have the darkness of this hour mixed with cold. Kind of sends that chill. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he not, Woman, I, I, don't, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You're also one of them. Man, I'm not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him for he's a Galilean. They could tell by his accent. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned to look straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord and spoke to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The prophecy of him denying the Lord three times before the rooster crowed came true. Can you imagine all the rest of the days of Peter's life, even as a faithful Christian, the morning would start out with the rooster crowing, and he goes, oh, I can't believe it. Wow. You know, it's kind of interesting. If you cross-reference this with other synoptic gospels, even the book of John, you will find that there are different individuals that actually confronted Peter there at the fire. Most likely what had happened is that this, this uh, period was the period of transfer from the high priest's house over to the Sanhedrin, which we're going to read about in just a second. So just at the perfect timing, of course, God appoints the times and the places, amen? Jesus is coming out of the house of the high priest after being intensively uh, interrogated for almost the whole night. And at that very moment is the third time Peter denies the Lord and they eye-lock each other. Whoa. Just imagine the sadness in Jesus and the heart stab in Peter, for he denied the Lord. As I was saying, the synoptics in John have other people confronting Peter. Luke is making a point right here. He's saying, here's this little slave girl confronting you. Oh, you're, you're with Jesus, and you deny the Lord. Now look what Luke writes. 63. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both chief priests and teachers of the law, met together. This is Sanhedrin. And Jesus was led before them. If you're the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. Now, Son of Man, remember, is our Daniel chapter 7 reference, 
where Jesus is coming on the clouds and he's going to judge all mankind. Amen? Verse 70. They all asked, are you the son of God? He replied, you are right in saying that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We've heard it from his own lips. You see right here, Jesus makes the good confession. Luke contrasts the one little servant girl going up to Peter saying, you're the one, you were with Jesus. Even though he's out in the safety of the courtyard around the warmth of the fire. But Jesus, he's been interrogated all night. He's being beaten and mocked by the soldiers. He's being brought up in front of the most powerful people in all of Israel, the Sanhedrin, and they go, are you the son of God? He says, it is as you said. Jesus confessed that he was Lord. What a difference between a guy that chickens out with a little slave girl and Jesus that stands up to a nation filled with Satan that's bound to kill him. You know, it's something else when people get baptized. I, I really have no idea how many people I've seen get baptized. But I'm always fired up. I mean, it was so cool at the beach party. You know, we had a lot of fun at the beach party. And uh, it was great. I, I felt church, you did a wonderful job keeping the level of competition Christian. That was awesome. I felt the Latin ministry fed us like kings. And then at, at the end, and Antonio was baptized. He's the, the father of one of the sons of one of the women in the Latin ministry. Here we are at the beach. Hundreds of people around, and we just stop everything. And he makes his good confession. Jesus is Lord. And he goes into that sparkly ocean and comes back a new man. Today, we're, we're so blessed because as we shared a little bit before, a few weeks ago, Raul Marino met a young man at Cal State Fullerton named Raul Garcia, and he was baptized into Christ. And it was a powerful baptism. And today, we're going to see his mom baptized into Christ. Is that awesome? And you know, what happens when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when she will say, Jesus is Lord, is we remember the time we said Jesus is Lord. I said it at 1.30 in the morning, April 11th, 1972, with four other people there. I remember. I got a video. It's not a snapshot. It's a video. I remember when my family members got baptized. My brother after a year and my sister after 16 years. I remember the people that I reached out to my fraternity. They got baptized. And they said, Jesus is Lord. I can remember so many of the baptisms of so many of you over the last year or so here. Each one, I go, wow, another person's becoming a disciple, a sold-out disciple of Jesus Christ. They are saying, no matter what happens, I'm following Jesus to the end. You know, our devotional Saturday night was a really happy time for me. We came here, as I said, about a year and a half ago with 40 disciples. And instead of having a congregational devotional where we all met together, we had congregational devotionals where there were five regions. And each one of the regions, I've heard incredible reports about just the spirit that was happened. And in fact, each one of those devotionals averages about 40 or 50 disciples. Is that cool? We also have almost 40 disciples now with the church planting that largely came out of Orange County in Honolulu. Is that exciting? Yeah. And now we have about 25 disciples in New York City with their first church service this coming Sunday. Yeah. And so in a very real way, in just 16 months, we've now seen a group of 40 multiply into seven groups just like it. Is that exciting? Yeah. 
And though today we get to see and feel and hear Raul's mom say, Jesus is Lord, we know that the same thing is happening in those places. That indeed, disciples are multiplying. They're multiplying in Los Angeles and saying, Jesus is Lord. They're multiplying in Honolulu saying, Jesus is Lord. They're multiplying in New York saying, Jesus is Lord. They're multiplying in D.C. saying, Jesus is Lord. They're multiplying in Santiago saying, Jesus is Lord. And we are here today having said, Jesus is Lord with the desire to hear as many people as possible proclaim his name throughout this world so that we can say at the end of our day that the world was evangelized in this generation. Yes, there was an hour of darkness, but next week, light comes into the darkness. Thank you. God bless.